So welcome to chapter two of the book where we're covering gross domestic product. What is it? Well, stay tuned to find out. What is gross domestic product? Well, it's a measure of income for a country. Now, that doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's for a country. It can be for a state or a province within a country. But generally speaking, it's for the nation as a whole. And as economists, we care about income. Namely, we care about per capita income because aggregate incomes aren't always going to be enough to tell us how well off a country is. And we want everyone to be better off. And by that, what I really mean is richer. So we need per capita income or a measure at the average of how everybody's doing. So what is per capita income? Well, it's essentially average incomes. It's the total income earned by an entire country divided by the total number of people living there. So if aggregate incomes in, say, Turpestan are 500 million catnips with 100,000 people living there, and in Derpistan we have 3 billion catnips, but a million people living there who's richer. Well, if we look at aggregate incomes, Derpistan's clearly the richer country. But if we look at income per capita, Turpestan's a much better place to live. Why? How? How do we know this? Well, let's start with Turpestani income. We'll take their income and divide it by the total number of inhabitants. So the formula is going to be Y divided by L, where Y is aggregate income at time T. L is the population at time T. Now, a quick little note here, a quick little aside. A lot of books and teachers will use a capital N for the size of the population, but it gets a little confusing if we start playing with the labor force, which is then labeled as LT. So what I did is I made a simplifying assumption, I bypassed some confusion, and I just say that L is the size of the population. Now, implicitly, I'm assuming that with L being the size of the population, everybody that lives there works, which in reality isn't really true. However, with the levels of complexity of the models that we'll be dealing with in this course, it's not that bad of an assumption because this is principles of macro. This isn't going to be some advanced macro modeling course where we need to relax some of those simplifying assumptions. They're very, we want things to be very easy and just very generalized here. So if I want income per capita in Chirpistan, then I just take that formula from the previous slide, right? Punch it in, punch all the numbers in, and I get 5,000 catnips. For Derpistan, I do the same thing, and I only get 3,000 catnips. So aggregate incomes don't always mean very much, because Derpistan had a much higher aggregate income, but the per capita income was a little different, because they had a lot more people living there. So this is why we're interested in income per capita, because it's going to give us a much better idea as to how much better off one country is than another, rather than just looking at the aggregate behaviors overall. Now, income is really better stated as gross domestic product, or for short, GDP, which is defined as the market value of all finished goods and services produced within a country over some length of time. Now, that length of time is typically reported in either quarterly or annual frequencies, although sometimes you'll see monthly. Generally speaking, though, if we're talking about GDP, past GDP, we're generally talking about, like, say, an annual frequency. What was GDP last year? Now, if we're looking at, like, kind of within a year, generally be quarterly, but that's kind of like, what was GDP this quarter or last quarter? Either way, it's a key measure of aggregate economic activity. Now, it's going to use the word finished in there because it only looks at the market value of all completed or all finished goods and services produced in a country. Now, why are we going to do this? Well, we do it because if we were to count everything in the production process, that's going to lead to double counting. Because if you count the value of the individual parts that go into this product and then the value of the product that came out, right, which intuitively you might think makes sense, it might be what you want to do, unfortunately what happens is you count each input twice, which isn't good. Because it's going to overinflate the numbers in your economy. Now, let's go through an example of this. I don't know what hobbies you guys have. I've got probably too many, to be honest with you. One of them, though, is playing guitar. I love to play guitar. One of my favorite things to do. So I figure if we're going to walk through this, let's build a guitar together. And hopefully in building this guitar, we can learn about why GDP is computed the way that it is. Now, if we want to build a guitar, obviously we're going to need inputs, right? We're going to need raw 
um, raw inputs, raw resources, so to speak. What are we going to need for that stuff? Well, we're going to need wood, right, for the body. Let's say it's 200 bucks. Okay. Well, we're going to need tuners. Those are little things that make sure the strings stay in tune so when you start playing something on guitar, it sounds nice and not like you're strangling a cat. We're going to need a tremolo and a tremolo bar because one end of the, the guitar neck, you've got the tuners, right, that tunes the strings. And the other side, you've got where the strings sit on the other side. It's, you know, a bridge, generally called a bridge. If the bridge is floating, meaning it's got some springs underneath that are counteracting the, the pull of the strings above, right, so it kind of floats. You can put a little bar in it, whammy bar, and wobble it and get all these cool little wee-wee-wee-wee sounds. It's awesome. It's really cool. Uh, if you want to know what it sounds like, listen to anything by Pantera, um, their guitarist did some really awesome stuff, um, with the tremolo. Anyways, a good tremolo is going to be about 300 bucks. Well, we're going to need pickups. What are pickups? What, what do they do? Well, they're these little magnets, right? Because the string vibrating, that's, you know, the kinetic energy of the string vibrating after you pluck it. That's cool, but you're going to need a way to get that string that strings movement, the strings vibration, you can need to turn that into electrical energy, which can then go to an amplifier, which then would pick that up and shape the sound, amplify it, and give us that really awesome heavy metal guitar tone that we all know and love. Well, we need pickups for that. So good pickups, set of good pickups is generally about $200. Now a neck for the guitar, we need a neck, all right, 100 bucks. We need frets, we need paint, because you don't want the guitar to look like crap when you're done. So we need some nice paint on it. We're going to need all the wiring, electronics, and stuff. Let's say it's 50 bucks, And, of course, people aren't going to work for free, and the stuff isn't going to put itself together, so you need labor. Labor is going to be, let's say, 600 bucks. So if you counted the value of all these things, you'd get about $2,400. Then the guitar needs to be sold at a price that generates some profit for the company because the company's not going to make this stuff just to break even, right? They want to get some profit that they can then reinvest into the company and then, um, you know, build more guitars or even just, you know, better guitars in the future. So we throw in a little bit of profit there. Guitar's price tag is going to be twenty six forty nine. Cool. Now, if we counted the value of each individual part and the value of the guitar when it was sold, we would have counted everything twice, which makes the economy look almost twice as good as it really is because the sum would be over $5,000. But remember, the price tag was twenty six forty nine, so we can't count the intermediate goods if we also want to count the finished product. So instead of counting every individual part, let's do the easy thing and look at the value that gets added to the sum of those parts. It's easier and likely a much more accurate way to look at it. Now, remember... This is a measure of production here, right? This isn't a measure of sales. It's just production. Because if you're producing goods and services, it's going to add to GDP whether it gets sold or not. And we can go into this a little bit more in the next lecture when we talk about the demand side of GDP. Because anything that's produced and not sold is still counted. It's just added to the, in, the, to the economy as what's known as unsold inventory. Now, as we think of GDP, there are numerous ways to compute it. So we're really going to focus on the big one here. But when we compute it, there are going to be two sides of the economy that we need to think about. We've got the demand side and then the supply side. The demand side buys all the stuff that the supply side makes. So in the previous example, right, we're approaching it from the supply side because we made something, right? Presumably, it would then be sold, but if there's no demand, nobody wants to buy your product, why the hell are you going to make your product? You're, all you're going to do is waste your time and your money. So with no demand, there's no supply, and then vice versa. So what is the supply side? Well, it's the side that makes the stuff that people want to buy. It means we produce things out of raw inputs, and then we sell the finished product to consumers. How do, me how do we measure that? Well, we're going to need a mathematical function, namely a function f that maps a set x into y. What do I mean? Well, what I really mean is that as x goes into the function f, it's going to produce y. x goes in, y comes out. So for every element x contained in the big set, or the, the big x there, the set x, so for every x contained in x, there's going to be a y contained in a set y, such that equation three 
holds with a quality. Now, before I go any further here, I do want you to know this isn't going to be an applied math course. So you will see some math throughout this lecture and other lectures. Yet, if it's really anything other than like a little bit of addition or multiplication or division, you're likely not going to have to do it. So if you ever see calculus, don't worry. You don't have to do any calculus in this course. Okay, now that disclaimer out of the way. It's something that's called a production function. And what it does is it takes one or more inputs, applies a function to them, does something to them, and then the output is what is produced in the economy. Now, because this is macroeconomics, we're thinking about the production function at the macro level. Namely, it's what's referred to as an aggregate production function. And because it's the aggregate production function, we're looking at the aggregate product of the entire country for that period in time. So the aggregate of everything that gets produced within that economy. Now, another little side note, you've probably seen that little subscript T for some of these variables. What is that? Well, that tells me what point in time we're looking at. Now, T is time, and time is discrete here, meaning that it's countable. So you've got like T equals one, T equals two, T equals three, we're looking at like whole number values. Now you'll also see, instead of like, you know, t equals one, t equals two, you'll also see t or t plus one or t plus two, right? They're really just saying the same things. They're just different ways of saying the same thing. So with that out of the way, let's say we got a function that takes a combination of two inputs and they produce one output. So for any point in time, we'll have labor L, capital K, We'll take these two inputs. Labor is measured in labor hours. Capital is going to be measured in dollar values of capital. And if you see that T subscript, that means this period or today, this quarter, this year, whatever the, um, uh, the frequency is of what we're looking at. So we know that L and K are going to go into the function, and we know that Y will come out of the function, but we need to know what the function is itself, right? How exactly are we going to be relating these two inputs into one single output? Well, we use what's known as a Cobb-Douglas production function, and it looks like what you see in equation four, where you get y equals a times k to the alpha times l to the one minus alpha. Alpha here is going to be less than one. So that exponent alpha is what's known as capital's share of income. How much of the income being produced is a result of variations in the capital stock? So if alpha is capital share of income, one minus alpha would be labor's share of income. Now, generally speaking, it's been the case that capital share of income has been about one third. Labor's share has been about two thirds, although that has been changing over recent years, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit more when we talk about growth and development. But let's plot this guy out. Now, if you go back and look, right, equation four has really two inputs. We'll get to that A term in a minute. Don't think of A so much as an input, but capital and labor are inputs. So we've got two inputs and one output, which gives us a function that exists in three-dimensional space. But I don't really want to, like, graph anything out in three-dimensional space. Why? Well, I'm not very good at it. I'm not very good at drawing stuff. So... What I'm really going to do is I'm just going to look at this in terms of capital and output, and I'm going to hold labor constant. So when I'm holding labor constant, what I'm really doing is I'm looking at that three-dimensional graph, and I'm rotating it a little bit so that I stare directly down the L-axis. Therefore, any variations in labor disappear. And I'm only looking at how output is changing as a result of variations or changes to the capital stock itself. We're not worried about labor. Now we could flip it the other way, right, and hold capital constant and then look at how output changes given variations in labor. But really, whatever you do to one, you can sort of think of it as what happened to the other. So if you want to know what it looks like, I'll just kind of graph it out holding K constant instead of L. Now note here, alpha is between 0 and 1, which is going to mean that the function is upward sloping in capital but it's gonna be increasing at a decreasing rate. And if you were to take the first and second derivatives, you would see what I mean here. So the marginal product of capital 
is going to be positive. The first derivative or the marginal product of output with respect to capital is always positive. So the marginal product of capital is always going to be positive. However, it will exhibit what's known as a diminishing marginal product of capital. So while you always increase production by adding capital, the more capital you add, the less output increases by. So each additional new unit of capital will become less productive. Now, suppose you want to see why this is. This is where we're going to do a little calculus. Note, calculus not required for exam. So let's say we take the production function and we take the derivative of that production function with respect to capital. Well, we get a times alpha times capital to the alpha minus 1, because remember you take the exponent, you multiply it by that leading coefficient, and you subtract 1 from the exponent. Now, L, of course, is treated as constant, so there's no change in L. And now we want to see what the sign is for all positive values of k. So wherever k is positive, I want to know what the sign of this derivative is going to be. Now, the first derivative gives the instantaneous rate of change. So if the first derivative is above that horizontal axis, it's going to be positive, which implies the slope of the function over whatever interval we're looking at is also positive. So to do this, I'm going to say, well, alpha is positive, so, and k is positive by assumption. Now, I also know that a and l are positive, so the function is positive. There's nothing negative in this function here. So that first derivative is positive everywhere. Now we can also plug in some numbers, right? Let's say a is 1, capital and labor are both 100, and alpha is 1 half. Well, okay, so we basically just get 1 half times 100 to the 1 half minus 1 times 100 to the 1 minus 1 half. Well, I get 1 half times 0.1 times 10. Well, 1 half times 0.1 is 0.05 times 10, right? I get 0.5. Well, 0.5 is greater than 0. Let's get to the second derivative, though, because the second derivative is the derivative of the first derivative, which gives me what you see in equation 7. a times alpha times alpha minus 1 times kt to the alpha minus 2 times lt to the 1 minus alpha. Now, we evaluate this guy a little bit more. You're going to get alpha squared minus alpha times k to the alpha minus 2 times l to the 1 minus alpha. Now, alpha squared minus alpha is going to be negative for any alpha between 0 and 1. Why is that? Well, if alpha is between 0 and 1, you get, say, 1 half, and you square it, right? Well, that square is now going to be smaller. So if you square alpha, you make alpha smaller. Alpha squared is always going to be smaller than alpha. A small number minus a bigger number is always going to be negative. And since every other input in this equation is positive, we know the second derivative has to be negative. So if I were to evaluate this guy at k equals 100, l equals 100, just, you know, just to make sure, we can see, well, that 1 half squared minus 1 half is negative. 1 half squared is 1 fourth. 1 fourth minus 1 half is negative 1 fourth. So that um, leading coefficient there is negative one-fourth. So that's negative, right? Well, everything else that we evaluate is going to be positive. So as we evaluate this guy out, I end up getting the second derivative with 100 units of capital and 100 units of labor is negative 0 0.0025. So our first derivative at k equals 100, l equals 100, was positive. So we add more capital, we get more output as a result. The second derivative at k equals 100, l equals 100, is negative, which means increasing capital always increases output, but by increasing capital, output increases by less and less each time. Hence, you see that it is upward sloping, but it's increasing at a decreasing rate. So where I say it's increasing, that tells me the first derivative, right? So it's increasing everywhere, but the rate at which it's increasing tells me the second derivative. It's decreasing everywhere. So it's always increasing, but increasing at a decreasing rate. So I talked about y, k, and l a little bit here, but let's talk about what a is. a is what's known as total factor productivity. 
and it's a unitless measure of efficiency, or we can think of like productivity. How productive are the inputs that are being used? The idea here is that these raw inputs of capital and labor aren't really going to be enough to fully explain what's going on with GDP. Because let's say you get a cool new idea for some awesome new invention, right? I love the movie Aliens. It's one of my favorite movies. So let's use the walking forklift thing that Ripley fights the queen alien in at the end. I hope to God you've seen Aliens. Otherwise, you're going to have no idea what I'm talking about. But let's say somebody actually invents that thing. Well, you can walk around, say, big construction sites, carrying really heavy things at a nice, brisk pace. And perhaps you can do so in areas that uh, just, you know, a forklift with wheels itself may have a little bit of difficulty getting to. So do you think that would increase production? I would argue that it would. It would let construction workers work much more efficiently. And I guarantee you, anybody you ask who works in this sector would tell you it would probably make their lives a lot easier. So what happens is this thing serves as a measure of an increase, or you could think of it as a decrease, in the efficiency of how each input or how each factor of production is used in the production process itself. So if you develop something that makes people more productive than they were before, it's an increase in total factor productivity, which would then be measured by an increase in A sub T. So it measures new ideas and technologies that aren't captured by the labor or capital stock themselves. Because if you have the labor stock, right, how do you measure people getting like cool new things that make them more efficient? You can't do it in labor because that's just raw labor hours. What about capital? Well, not really, because it's just the dollar value of the capital. So it doesn't really get reflected by the inputs of L or K. So you need something else to really describe what's going on with GDP. Because if we were to put this to like a statistical model, and we were to measure capital and labor as inputs, and then we were to look at GDP as the output, you would get a discrepancy across the board. It wouldn't match up. And that discrepancy would be pretty big. What's going on with that? Well, what's going on is that discrepancy you could think of as ideas. How ideas are causing the economy to grow by making people more efficient. They produce more efficiently. Because if you think about it, we haven't had, we don't have more resources today than we did 200 years ago. But our economy is way more productive today than it was 200 years ago. Why is that? Well, it's because we get ideas. We invent new things that make production more efficient, right? Cars are much more fuel efficient today than they were 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, meaning they use less gas to travel the same distance. How do we think of that? Well, we could think of that as an increase in total factor productivity. People figure out how to make cars more efficient. So GDP computed just from the factors of production alone isn't really going to be enough to explain what GDP actually is. However, if we allow for that discrepancy, that difference between what we compute and what GDP actually shows, if we consider that difference is ideas and new inventions, okay, well, now we've got something. We've got something we can follow, something we can like measure and go, hey, these are the, this is the value of the new ideas that were being produced. Now, if, say, we can compute what GDP is based on capital and labor, and that is equal to what observed GDP actually is, well, the economy had no new ideas. Things were steady as usual. Not good, but not bad either. When that happens, what is AT equal to? Well, if I can explain what GDP is based on just capital and labor then a sub t would be equal to 1 because it's not scaling anything up or down. But when there is growth, the production function gets shifted up by a factor of a sub t being larger than 1, say 1 1.1, 1 1.2, 2, 3, 4, whatever. And what that means is if a sub t is larger than 1, we're using the same amount of resources to produce, but we're getting more out of those resources. And this is what it looks like. You can kind of see it sort of pivoting that production function upward a little bit. Why is it not shifting it upward altogether? Well, it's not doing that because if you look at the origin, the origin, capital zero, Y is zero. You're not going to get something for nothing. All right, so if capital zero output is also going to be zero, it's never going to be positive. If you've got zero inputs, you're not going to make something out of thin air. So always, 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 
capital zero, output zero, or labor zero, output zero. Now, in seeing this thing pivot upward a little bit, right, that's saying I can use the same amount of capital as before, but I can get farther. I can do more with it. I can produce more things and I can do it more efficiently. But there's a big difference here between changing the capital or the labor stock and changing total factor productivity. Because if I were to change the capital or labor stock, what I'm doing is I'm moving to a new point on the same curve because capital and labor are endogenous to the model. What I mean by that is that there are equations that describe both capital and labor in the model that can be changed from inside the model or from within. Total factor productivity, or A, is exogenous to the model, which means the, there's an equation that describes the evolution of A, but it's determined from outside the model. And as we get a little bit further into this course, we'll see there's no one equation that describes everything. There are multiple different equations. So there's going to be an equation for capital. There's going to be an equation for labor. And that'll describe how capital is supplied to the economy, how labor is supplied to the economy. It'll also describe how the demand for labor changes. You get a separate equation for that. You get all these different equations. Now, if output can be changed by changes in capital and labor, and capital and labor can be changed by things such as, say, for labor, we're going to think about the wage rate, or for capital, we're going to think about the interest rate, Right? There are multiple moving parts here, and we can change labor or change capital by changing what the interest rate or the wage rate would be, which would then change what output is. So those guys are endogenous. A is determined from outside the model. Right? It's, you, you can't go, hey, let's change this thing and we're going to give new people new ideas. No, people get new ideas because they just get new ideas, at least according to the way that this model evolves. So if we were to change k or l, what we do is we move to a new point on the same curve. If we change a, we move to a new curve entirely. So a shifts the production depending on whether it's a positive or negative shock to TFP, and then k or l just move us to a new point on the same production curve. So if we were to shift a, this is what we get here. If we were to change capital, there's no shift occurring in this curve. What's happening is we just move to a new point on the existing curve because we just increased the capital stock. And well, Y is a function of the capital stock. It can be chosen from within the model. Therefore, if you increase the capital stock, you'll increase output. Let's go through some examples here. So let's say we've got the following table. And this table represents the Chirpistani production for the years 2016 and 2017. I know a long time ago, I wrote the book in late 2017, early 2018. So these are the latest figures that I had for the country of Chirpistan, so sue me. Now, these are going to give us the amount of labor and capital used in each year. And we're not going to be so concerned about what total factor productivity is just yet. Because I really just want to compute what GDP is based on the inputs of capital and labor. We'll get to TFP in a little bit. So let's say I want to know what GDP for each year is. And we're going to let alpha be equal to one half for just ease of computation here. Well, 2016, capital is 1,700, labor is 1,600. So I plug in 1,700 and 1,600, and I get 1,649.24 catnips. For 2017, the capital stock increased a little bit. Labor increased, well, a little bit less. So plug those numbers in, I get 1,702.35 catnips. So absent any changes in TFP, we can compute what GDP was in 2016 and 2017 for the country of Chirpistan. So we can see how the production function takes labor and capital inputs, and it's going to yield an output Y, where Y is expressed in terms of output and prices. Or sorry, when Y is expressed in terms of output and prices. It's what's known as aggregate supply. So if you remember from principles of microeconomics, Right, you see your demand, you see your supply. Well, if it's upward sloping, you know, output and prices, it's aggregate supply. The aggregate supply stuff that we're going to be looking at versus like just the normal supply you see in principles of micro, yeah, they're they're different concepts, but the end result really kind of looks the same. But that's for much, much further down the road. So let's say 
we're going to change total factor productivity for the year 2017. We're going to let A be equal to 1.5. So what I'm doing is I'm really scaling output up, right? Because the inputs are the same. So the inputs are still 1702.35, but I'm multiplying that input, or that, sorry, the, that output, 1702.35, by 1 1.5, which gives me 2553.53. So a TFP shock, where A is equal to 1.5, increases output by 150%. And essentially, this is one of the ways that we can try to account for growth in an economy. It's sort of a crude approach to accounting for growth. We'll learn more about this when we get into economic growth and development, but it's a decent enough measure for growth in the economy, at least for the level of complexity that we're looking at for the scope of this course. Meanwhile, let's say we change capital in 2017. So we add 900 units. So it, similarly, it's a 150% increase to capital. And we're going to keep L and A the same. What do we get? Well, plug that guy in there. We get 2084.95. So if I were to increase capital, yeah, I do increase output, but I don't, in, and you know, I, you can see I increased capital by 150%, the same way I increased total factor productivity. But output didn't increase by 150%. It increased by less than 150%. So if I increase one of my inputs by the same amount that I increased A sub T, I don't get anywhere near the same increase in output. And there are plenty of reasons for this. We can, mathematical reason would be because of that Cobb-Douglas specification, K and L are exponentiated to powers less than 1, where A isn't. The economic reasons might be easier to understand at least a little bit, without all this math, because capital and labor have diminishing marginal productivity. If you remember all the second derivative crap that I showed you guys earlier. Now, if you add capital or if you add labor to production, you'll always get more output, but output will increase by less and less every time. So what I recommend you do is try this with the table in slide 29. Try increasing K or L by different amounts and look at how much output increases by each time. Maybe like try doubling or tripling K or L and see for yourself. And then try doubling K and L rather than just one of them. Double both of them and see what you get. Might get some pretty interesting things there. Now, this is going to wrap up the lecture on the supply side of the economy and the computation of GDP from the supply perspective, so to speak. Next time, we're going to be talking about the demand side of the economy, and we're going to learn how the expenditure side of GDP gets split up. And this will show us the equilibrium between how output's produced and how output gets used. From there, we'll go on, talk about the shortfalls in GDP, how GDP is not exactly a perfect measure of economic activity or output, because there are some things that aren't counted in GDP, some because they shouldn't be, some because, well, they should be, but how the hell do you measure it? And we can talk about why some of these things can be a bit of a problem. But for now, we're done, so peace out.